My name is Milton, and I'm 30 years old. A few years ago, I decided to rent a house in the woods through Airbnb, just for one weekend. I wanted to spend some quality time with my girlfriend, Amanda, among nature. We were taking our dog, Spith, with us, too. Amanda thought it was a great idea. We arrived there in the early evening on a Friday. I parked the car right in front of the house after driving for two hours. This is wonderful, Milton. It's so peaceful and romantic, my girlfriend said as we got inside the house. It was small but very cozy. It had a fireplace too, which besides being pleasant was also very convenient since it was the middle of January. Both me and Amanda were big fans of winter. Definitely. Uh, today we can just eat and rest by the fireplace. Tomorrow we can explore the surroundings during the day. The fresh air will be good for us. Clean our systems out, you know? I said. Excellent. I'll prepare the food while you can light the fire. Just like the good old days, huh? Yeah, I'm starving, I said. Our dog Spiff, after being fed was anxious to go outside. I wasn't very happy with the idea of letting him go out after night, especially in a foreign and wild environment, but he wouldn't shut up. Sometimes you just need to let dogs go out and do what they need to do. He's a smart dog, and according to what we read about the surroundings, there's no bears or other predators that could hurt him, Amanda said. Yeah, you're right. In any case, it's not like we have a choice. All right, boy. The night's young, come on, I said as I opened the door to let Spiff out. Within the next few hours, me and Amanda had our meals and then we fell asleep, sitting on the comfortable couch by the warm fireplace. We woke up when it was around 2 a.m. and I heard a dog barking in a painful manner deep into the woods. Oh no, Spiff's in trouble, I said as I got up. Are you going outside, Milton? Of course. I gotta go get him. That's why I brought my shotgun. On the other hand, it wasn't a good idea to bring Spith. Lesson learned. Stay here, Amanda, and lock the doors when I'm outside. I said as I picked up my gun and prepared myself to leave. Okay, be careful, she said. And so, I walked outside the door and went into the woods, my left hand holding a flashlight and my right one carrying my shotgun. For a while, I was still able to listen to the noises of Spiff. He appeared to be in pain. I was now extremely concerned. The noise stopped, which didn't make me feel better. But still, I had a good idea of where the noise came from. I just hope he's all right. Maybe he fell into a hole or something. Maybe he was trapped. I said to myself, trying to be positive. After a while of walking through the trees and bushes, I heard something, or someone. I tried to remain silent. I could hear someone breathing. I didn't know if it was an animal or a person. But then, out of the blue, or should I say out of the dark, I heard a wicked laughter, <laughs> and I got hit in the head by something. It wasn't a rock or anything that could take me down, but it still hurt. Damn! What the... Oh my god, Spiff! I screamed as I realized the decapitated head of my dog was thrown at me. I was now listening to howls which resembled wolves. Someone was chasing me. I could see red eyes coming towards my direction. It was a tall figure like a man running on two feet. I didn't have time to figure out who or what it was. I was now running for my life. I heard it roaring and howling like a canine, but running like a man. I shot my gun in the air a couple of times and thought it would scare off the creature, but it kept chasing me, getting closer. Amanda, open the door! Let me in for the love of God! I shouted as I got closer to the house, leaving the forest behind me. I was surprised by two things. First, I saw the door was already open. Then, as I looked back, I noticed the creature was no longer behind me. It didn't leave the woods. 
perhaps frightened by the idea of getting shot. I entered the house, calling for my girlfriend. Terrified, I realized the main room where we sat by the fireplace was a complete mess. The sofa and chairs misplaced, destroyed, broken glass. And then I saw my girlfriend lying on the floor, surrounded by a pool of blood. Amanda? Amanda, oh my God! There was nothing I could do. She was dead. There were bite marks all over her neck, but the bloody floor revealed footprints of a human. In tears, I called the police. It took them almost one hour to arrive at the house. I told them what happened. A few hours later, they searched the woods, but found nothing, except what was left of my dog. One of the police officers, a man in his 60s, spoke to me in private and said, I shouldn't say this to you, but I grew up in a small town nearby. Folks have legends and beliefs about a dog-man creature, half dog, half human. When I was a kid, I didn't see something like that, but as I grew older, I tried to convince myself that my mind was just playing tricks on me. But the fact is, what you described, the creature chasing you, is what killed your dog and your wife. It's undisputed. The footprints, both in the house and in the surroundings, are nothing more and nothing less than those of human. Hopefully we can find what did this to your girlfriend and your dog. I'm sorry for your loss. It's a complete tragedy. And a tragedy it was. Months went by, but nothing and no one was ever found. A few articles and even TV reports spoke about the case, as they mentioned a cryptic legend of a dogman who lived in the woods. The evidence is, in fact, mysterious. Maybe that is true, but it doesn't matter, because I will never get my girlfriend back, or even my dog. Regardless what is the truth, I will never visit any forest again in my life. And although it's not my fault, I will never forgive myself for what happened. A dark night in front of the computer, a frigid glass of soda, and a bowl of cheese puffs. What more could a man ask for? I thought of these things, enjoying the peace of that moment. The only illumination in the room provided by the screen in front of me. Knowing the ins and outs of a PC doesn't qualify a person for what I choose to do that night, but it surely helps. Scrolling past yet another picture of people having fun, I found myself nauseated, rejecting the kind of enjoyment that these people found pleasant. I don't need something like that, I whispered, taking yet another handful of cheese puffs. Close the shutters, I asked my voice-activated assistant as I felt like needing some additional privacy. Shutters closed. She hummed back as the little servos pulled the ropes until the blinds didn't allow indiscreet eyes to see inside. After cleaning the chip dust off my hand on a paper napkin, I found my cursor on the screen, double-clicking on the app I hadn't used yet. I had found this browser to navigate the dark web, but being busy or otherwise uninterested I simply installed it and never tried it. <laughs> Why not? The starting page opened up to a blank screen, a few instructions detailing how to get around to various URLs. Anything and everything one could want, illegally speaking, could be found. Of course, with reasonable limitations. Illegal gun stores won't be selling you warheads, for example, but those weren't what I was there for anyway. I was but a tourist, an internet explorer, so to speak. Finding boredom in the various illegal marketplaces, I decided to browse the artistic sections instead. I found a few web pages linking to various art expositions, detailed the prices of various paintings or even 3D digital art sold for 3D printers or other uses. Quite shady stuff, 
considering some of these included pistols that could fire real bullets. Looking mesmerized at that page by the dark backdrop, I almost failed to notice the blue dot of light coming from my webcam. Has the LED light always been on? Just as I thought that, looking down from the monitor, it turned off. What the? I whispered, thinking I might be seeing things. Another link, bringing me to a far different page, immersed my retinas in the mesmerizing colors of oil spillages and fractals. In this chaotic visual noise, pictures were floating in space as I scrolled down using the wheel, like a photo of the page creator, his small company, etc. Quite interesting, I thought. Then, music started playing, a dissonant church organ putting together a demented melody that froze me stiff for how loud it was. How do I... How do I turn this off? I muttered to myself, finding a way to the audio controls of my OS. Into it, the audio didn't seem to be coming from the web browser at all. Where from then? Bobbing up and down, the volume control made me notice that the audio was, in fact, playing from the PC music player instead. How was that possible? Minimizing the window of the browser, the audio player was indeed open. That awful melody was now active, the title of it being Too Late Now. Closing it on an instinct, the window reopened another instance of itself by the side, almost as if it had dodged the click. Too Late Now, still present as a name. I couldn't get rid of it. Even trying to terminate the process forcibly wouldn't have an effect. It just kept reappearing. Distracted, looking at the video player, I hadn't noticed that the browser had undergone a change. Opening it back up, wondering if it was causing the weird glitch, the page was now set on another URL. A black screen, a single sentence on the screen. I control your computer now. My jaw dropped seeing that sentence appear. It must have been a joke, right? The entirety of my computer froze up as something was being injected into it. A string of code by the nefarious purpose, and after a minute, it unfroze. A red flashing light by the bottom of the screen was insistently lit up. Clicking it, a view of a camera feed appeared. What's this? I muttered, tempted to pull out the power, but before I could... The sentence on the browser changed. If you pull the power now, they will all die. Who was he talking about? My face became pale when looking at the feed, showing what clearly was my family, tied and being dragged in front of the camera by two burly men in balaclava. I have them. Next to that window, showing me the crying faces of my parents, terrified at what might happen to them. Another window appeared, with my face on it and a red dot on top. The sick bastard was recording all of my reaction as well. They are safe with me, said the text on the screen, the little smile at the end mocking me in an irritating way. Just as that sentence stopped, a flashing vertical line appeared under the text, inviting me to write. What do you want? I typed, gulping my spit. He couldn't have possibly been doing this for no reason, unless... Deposit the entirety of your Bitcoin wallet to this account. My jaw dropped. He was asking for over $50,000 to an address that was likely going to make the money disappear as fast as I could deposit it. The text once again wrote something else. I'm going to start counting, and they will start losing fingers. My heart felt like it was sinking into my chest, lost to an insurmountable despair. As a minute counter started, one of the burly men opened a black bag he was dragging 
taking a big pair of pincers from it. With the help of the other man, they immobilized my mom, placing the pincers around her ring finger. The countdown was now at 45 seconds. Horrified by what I was seeing, I typed up a storm, pleading for him to stop, saying I was going to pay. Out of options and grinning so hard my teeth hurt, I complied. As the money was received, the two men let go of my mother. Going up to the camera, the video feed stopped right at that moment. I could see a lot more transactions happen quickly afterwards in my electronic wallet, probably the money being passed over dummy accounts over and over. The chat screen came up once again, a message saying, Thank you for your patronage. Goodbye. And then the window closed on its own. Soon afterwards, I uninstalled the browser and reset my PC to a previous installation state, fueled by a deep panic. God knows what would have happened had I not obeyed. The question is, how could they have gotten to my family in that little of time? Unless I was being tracked for far longer than I thought. My friends and I had planned a trip for months, looking forward to hiking, exploring, and enjoying the fresh air. I couldn't wait to spend it with them. However, alongside came a rearrangement of my understanding. I never believed in ghosts or spirits. The idea of them always seemed far-fetched, like something surreal. That all changed when I booked an Airbnb for a weekend getaway with my friends. The place seemed perfect. It was a beautiful cabin nestled in the woods, surrounded by trees and the peaceful sounds of nature. It was far from civilization, but that was the whole point. We wanted to escape our busy lives for a while and enjoy some much needed relaxation. The host, a woman named Karen, seemed nice enough. She greeted us warmly when we arrived. Karen was a middle-aged woman with kind eyes and a gentle smile. She had shoulder-length brown hair that was neatly styled and wore a simple but elegant dress that seemed to match the aesthetic of the cabin. As she showed us around, I couldn't help but notice how meticulous she was in her preparations. The cabin was spotless, with fresh linens on the beds and a fully stocked kitchen. Karen seemed to have thought of everything. She provided us with a map of the area and recommendations for nearby attractions and even left us a plate of homemade cookies as a welcoming gift. Overall, Karen struck me as a warm and friendly person, and I felt grateful to have her as our host. Little did I know, things were about to take a dark turn. Maybe it was the one room Karen didn't show us that kept me uneasy. That was her room, but I didn't think it mattered at that moment. After we slept, I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of someone moving around in the kitchen. At first, I thought it was one of my friends getting a midnight snack, but when I got up to check, I found the kitchen empty. I brushed it off as my imagination and went back to bed. But then I heard it again. This time, I was sure it wasn't one of my friends. The sound was too deliberate, too purposeful. I grabbed a flashlight and cautiously made my way to the kitchen, heart pounding in my chest. That's when I saw her. A woman, dressed in a white gown, was standing in the middle of the kitchen. She had long flowing hair and a serene expression on her face. I froze unable to move or speak. The woman turned towards me, her gaze meeting mine. It was then that I realized there was something wrong with her eyes. They were dark, almost black, and filled with malevolent energy that made my blood run cold. I screamed and ran back to my room, waking up my friends in the process. They thought I was crazy, insisting that it was just a nightmare. But I knew what I had seen, and it wasn't just my imagination. The next day, we tried to brush it off and enjoy our weekend, but things only got worse. We started hearing strange noises throughout the cabin, like someone was moving around in the other room or whispering in our ears. Doors would open and close on their own, and we found objects moved from their original position. It was clear that something was wrong with the cabin, but we didn't want to leave. We had paid good money for this getaway and didn't want to cut it short. That was a mistake we would soon regret. One night, we were all gathered around the fireplace, trying to relax after a particularly unsettling day. That's when we heard a knock at the door. 
It was Karen, our host, looking frantic and scared. She told us that the cabin was cursed and that it was built on sacred ground where a tragedy had occurred many years ago. A family had been murdered in the woods and their spirits still haunted the land. She begged us to leave, pack our things and go home the first thing in the morning. That night we all slept together, but were all woken up by a scream. It was Karen, who had been staying in the room next to ours. We rushed to her room. As we stepped inside, the musty smell of old books and decaying wood filled our nostrils. The decor was outdated and mismatched, with dusty old portraits staring down at us from the walls. There was an old-fashioned fireplace that crackled and popped with sinister energy. The flames cast dancing shadows across the walls, making the room feel alive with some kind of ancient power. Her bed was lumpy and uncomfortable, with sheets that smelled faintly of mildew. The windows were covered with thick curtains that blocked out all light, making the room feel like deep, dark pits. And while we tried to take in the strangeness of the room, we found the woman lying on the floor unconscious. There was a strange symbol carved into her forehead, one that we didn't recognize. We knew that we had to leave. We grabbed our things and ran out of the cabin, not looking back until we were far away. It wasn't until later that we learned the truth. One of my friends remained adamant that we had to call the police and report everything that happened in that place. Although I didn't believe in spirits and ghosts, Karen's story and the strange occurrence that happened to her were tampering with my brain. I found myself believing that maybe they existed. I couldn't seem to forget the figure I saw in the kitchen also. However, the rest of my friends agreed that we would involve the police and report all that we saw. The police were called and they investigated the cabin. It was then that they found evidence of the cult's presence, including strange symbols etched into the walls and floors. But what we learned next shook us to the core. Karen, our host, had been a member of the cult. She had used Airbnb to lure in unsuspecting victims, hoping to use them as sacrifices for the cult's rituals. But she had made a fatal mistake. She had offended the other cult members, and they had turned on her, carving the strange symbol into her forehead as a warning to others who might cross them. It was a shocking revelation, and one that left us all feeling betrayed and violated. Karen had seemed like such a kind and welcoming host, but in reality, she was a monster. The experience had shaken us to the core, leaving us with a newfound respect for power. Now, whenever I see an Airbnb listing that seems too good to be true, I can't help but think back to that fateful weekend. I know that some places are better left unexplored, and some secrets are better left buried, especially if they have a beautiful host that seems to be too nice. I can't get over the PTSD that my first experience awarded me.